So um, I guess yeah, it's time to it's time to commence. So um, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I guess if you um, I'll take a break at some point and pick up the surveys from you um, once we get get going a little bit. Um, so so the, the this is the tutorial on language independent methods of clustering similar contexts with applications and. Um, the idea here is to talk about some you know, general methods that I think will apply to a fairly wide range of problems and try and provide a little bit of that theoretical background as well as um, looking at some specific tools you can use. And in particular, I have, a, I have a bootable CD or a live CD as I call it that will let you, if you have a laptop, boot up and start actually doing some of these things and we will, um, and we'll We'll give it a try and get you started with that. Um, is I don't that doesn't sound to me like the microphone is on. Should it should it be? Or is yeah. it? It is on. But is I, I think it's not required because it's up to you. I don't know. I'm. Are we okay? No, we are perfectly okay are in my okay. view. I, I don't do know. I, I hear myself really well, but then I'm standing right beside well. myself. So. Yeah. Okay, let me know if, if my voice wears out and, you know, <laughs> after three hours you can't even see me. I'm laying on the floor <laughs> reciting to you. Then we'll use the microphone. Um, so, um, you want, you can use the phone. You know, the phone. Oh, I'm good. No. I'll be okay. I'll, use that, so, yeah. no, I'll just talk endlessly. Um, so, um, so that's the basic. That's the basic topic. And just, just um, that's me, Ted Peterson. Um, and you are welcome to contact me um, about any of this or anything that seems related. Uh, you know, uh, via email or while we're here. Um, you know, please don't, please, please don't hesitate to do that. Uh, or, or to ask questions here today as we're going along. Um, the there, there's a series of terms. Uh, or words that we use in the title of this tutorial, and I, and I want to kind of briefly describe what exactly it is we're going to be looking at. And the first part of the equation was sort of the language independent methods. And the idea there is that we're going to attack a certain type of problem or set of problems um, using methods that can be fairly easily applied to whatever language you happen to be interested in. And that means that we don't build in dependencies uh, on the availability of certain um, software tools, resources like parsers or other sorts of um, language specific tools like that. Um, nor do we build in requirements for um, manually constructed resources uh, like a, you know, a dictionary or a thesaurus or some sort of um, other kind of knowledge source that we may only have for some subset of languages. And so we're looking here at methods that we're looking here at methods that are relying very much on just raw information found in the, in the corpora that we are interested in, in dealing with. Um, and so we avoid and eschew any um, manually annotated data of any kind because that builds in these kinds of dependencies. And, and so we're unsupervised in a very sort of strict sense. Um, and that lets us be fairly portable um, across languages. Um, and, and so the, the objective here is to talk about the problem of clustering similar contexts. And here, context is meant in a very sort of generic way, uh, such that it's just basically a short unit of text. Maybe a phrase or a paragraph. Uh, could be longer, you know, it could just be a few words. Um, and the idea is that we take that as our input and we produce some number of clusters where we have hopefully organized the members of those clusters uh, such that they are more similar to each other, that is, the, their fellow cluster members, than they are the members of the other clusters. And that's our objective. So that's sort of what this is about. Um, and the applications that we, uh, among the applications that we'll mention, um, we'll, we'll introduce some terminology um, talking about headed context and headless context shortly. Um, but the idea is there's a variety of problems that we can deal with, uh, things relating to word senses or name discrimination um, or things like organizing email and clustering documents, these kinds of things. Um, and, um, you know, it, it, 
the, the, the class of problems is, is reasonably broad and is, is really only, um, uh, these are only sort of suggestions of at least things I've thought about or tried to do. Um, so, so what are we going to do? And I, I admit to making some sort of uh, reasonably recent changes here to the, to the outline. Um, I'll have these, the, the revised slides. They're not significantly revised, but there are some places where I've removed things and added new things. I'll make those slides available on a website, and if you put your email address on the survey form, I'll, I'll, send, you the, I'll send you that uh, when that's available. And um, uh, you can look at my homepage, too, and just I'll have a little link to that when I do that. I'm sure I'll do that within the next week or so. Um, so, so these are the, 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 the topics that we're going to be talking about. Um, how do we go about identifying these features in large corpora? Um, what are the different ways that we can represent these contexts that we would like to cluster? Um, what about dimensionality reduction? How do we do that? What does that mean? And then some issues relating to clustering. Um, in particular, um, you know, what kinds of clustering techniques does one uh, use? And, and what are some of the variations there that um, you can employ? Um, and then um, some discussion of um, how do we identify how many different clusters there are? Um, and then finally a little bit about how do we actually know what we've discovered, that is labeling the clusters. And then we'll have a little bit of time for um, kind of experimenting on your, uh, not on your own, I'll experiment with you, but kind of a guided tour, if you will. Um, and, um, and so, so that'll kind of take us through the, um, through the program here. Um, just a few miscellaneous points. We have a break, I guess, scheduled from 4 to 4.30, and as far as I can tell, they're, the break like starts before and ends. I mean, they're, they're kind of strict on the time, so so we will stop at, at four for the for the break and uh, resume at four thirty. And I'll just stop. You know, I'll I'll keep an eye on my watch if I somehow uh, miss that. Wave your arms and let me know. Um, we will finish uh, punctually um, at six because I guess tonight there is the reception at the the castle, right? I call it the castle. What what is the place? Nice to see you. Okay. Um, and uh, that, I guess, starts at 7, so, so you should have you know, adequate time to get there and such. Um, we are also videotaping this, which, which is Reinhardt's, uh, that was his idea, um, and he is kindly volunteering to, to man the video camera and help with that. And so, um, unless this just turns into a debacle, um, <laughs> we'll post the video and you can admire it. And, and uh, uh, well, you know, not that you should admire it, but just it will be available to you, or if there's something here we say that might be of interest to students or colleagues that you have, please, you know, feel free to refer that to them. And so I'll probably create a, I'll create a page that has, you know, a link to the video, a link to the slides, and maybe some other miscellaneous stuff, and I'll let you know when that's available. That's, that's pretty easy to do. Um, uh, as, as I mentioned, questions are, are certainly appropriate, um, as are any other kinds of comments or observations you have. The uh, Nopix CD, the live CD that you're going to get, this is the first time we've done that, and it is recently completed. So, uh, in a sense, you are sort of a generation of alpha testers. Um, well, I was the alpha tester, and, and so you're the beta testers at this point. And so, uh, you know, things about that that you like or don't like uh, are, are very important, actually. So, um, so, so that's kind of what's coming up. Um, so the, the package that um, we have included in the Nopix uh, distribution is called Sense Clusters, and this is a package that is designed for clustering similar contexts. Um, it is designed to be something that you can set quite a number of different parameters and do a whole lot of really different things. So it doesn't, it doesn't advocate a particular methodology. Uh, it, it provides a, you know, quite a lot of um, options for you to take advantage of. And that's what you'll get on the CD. Uh, it includes, it, it has its own sort of components and it ties together uh, some uh, clustering package and a package that does the SVD um, and so forth. And so um, so what you get in the CD is you basically get, a, you, you boot the CD, you get a Linux, you get Linux coming up. Um, and you will have a, a, a main page that refers you to sense clusters and sense clusters is running there in its web interface form and on the command line. And um, so you can use that. You also have a pretty much a full service Nopix um, 
distribution with just a few things removed because you need to make room for the new stuff you add. But it's pretty much a fully functional Mapix distribution, so um, it may be useful for other things as well if you haven't used it. It's very neat, and, and if you have, you know, if you have a, a laptop, I mean, don't worry about it. it it's not going to try and install anything on, on your hard drive unless you specifically request that, and you really have to kind of know what you're doing. So you're not going to damage anything um, by doing this, and uh, you know, so I, I, I hope that'll be useful and interesting. Um, so, um, just a few, before we get too deeply into this, um, a lot of the work, especially on sense clusters, has been done by two, um, two students who have worked with me over the last few years who, who deserve great credit for, um, you know, for what you'll see. Um, and, um, you know, really, the, um, particularly the whole sense clusters package, I mean, I haven't, it's remarkable how little I've done. Um, I did do the Nopix, I did create the Nopix distribution though, so if, you, if there are problems with that, that's, that's mine, that's my doing. And if there are problems with other stuff, that's probably my doing too, because I probably told them to do it the wrong way. Um, so, um, so, so I just wanted to make, mention Emrick and Monica uh, to you, and for all the good work they've done, say thank you. Um, so um, so let's, let's kind of get into this a little bit. Um, and, and what is it we want to do, and why do we want to do it? Um, that terminology we mentioned about headed and headless contexts, um, there are really two different kinds of contexts that we're talking about here. Um, a headed context is, is a short unit of text that includes a particular target word, we'll call it. We'll call that a target word. And our goal is really, in that case, to cluster the context, or cluster the target words, such that we can see something about the na their nature. If, these are, if, if it's a particular word with multiple senses, like line or interest, our goal is to create clusters that reflect, hopefully, the different senses of line and interest. Um, if it's an ambiguous name, um, like John Smith, our goal is to create contexts or create clusters that represent the different John Smiths that may exist in the world. Um, and so the headed contexts are very much focused on this, this target word and, and finding out things about it. Um, the headless context has no target word. It is, it is really just a short, a short unit of text that we are going to try and, and cluster and group based on its own sort of merit. Um, and um, um, we're, we're, we're not so much focusing on the target word as we are the, the context as a whole. And that, that'll, that'll, that'll become clear as we go along here a little bit. Um, so we'll use that terminology a little bit. Just an example of, of a headed, headed context, simple example. Um, here my target word is shell. And I have these short contexts, little sentences, that are in no particular order, and I want to uh, go ahead and cluster these such that I sort of organize the contexts such that we can see something about shell. And in, in the best case, you know, we, we might see something like this, where we get two clusters, one associated with the operating system notion of shell, and another uh, with the sort of beach, beach sense of shells, seashells. Um, that's an example of what we want to do with headed contexts. Um, the headless contexts, you can see, um, are just, you know, sentences. There's not a particular target word that ties them together. But for whatever reason, we want to organize them, you know, relative to each other. And this is sort of the unordered input. And what we want to get out at the end uh, is something organized, you know, hopefully like this, where cluster one is talking about um, computers and cluster two is, um, about automobiles, and, um, and and so that's kind of the those are the two basic sorts of um, uh, ways that we can formulate um, problems uh, here. And so it's you know in my case, I mean my, my background is a, a lot of it has been in word sense disambiguation and things like that. So I, I, I particularly think about the headed context a lot, uh, but. Um, uh, you know, if, you, if you're thinking about organizing email or, or doing things like that, uh, the headless context may seem more natural. Um, and we have data. We have data on the CD that um, uh, you know both kinds of data, so you can do experiments uh, of either type, which, which should be interesting. So, um, just an example of the kinds of applications that we might be thinking of. We've sort of 
foreshadowed that a little bit. Um, but one of, the, one of the problems that seems to fit into this notion of clustering short contexts uh, may be found in, in web search, for example. Um, and when you do a web search, you're looking for certain words. I mean, you can think of them as target words. All the things you find contain this particular word uh, that you're searching for are words, and um, therefore you have kind of a notion of a target, a target word. And of course, we know that web search results are, are sort of disorganized. And um, we have people, organizations, places that share the same name, and you get them all jumbled up to some degree. And so, um, uh, so, so this is this is the kind of problem that might lend itself to some of these kinds of methods. Um, the, the the relationship there's a relationship in this case between the head context and the headless context because when you when you when you click on uh, some of the links that you find via your headed your headed um, context, you might in fact find a page that is about a particular target word without really mentioning it. And so that might be an example of another way that you find headless contexts outside of the idea of email, for example. And so, um, so in, in um, web search, the one of the, the one of the problems that sort of lends itself to this is this idea of, of name discrimination or name dis name name disambiguation. And to illustrate that, we have we have created a rather frightening image um, that, that combines two, two famous and important people um, uh, into a single image. Um, any, you, if you were at the workshop yesterday, the, were any of you at the cross-lingual workshop? Ah, oh, you saw this, you have to, you have to, you have to hold your thumb. Um, but, um, so if you weren't there, I mean, look at these images, see if you can sort it out. Anyone recognize anyone there? These aren't probably people, you, you know these people, you probably don't have pictures of them, you know, probably not. But anyway, so, so George Miller, um, father of WordNet, and um, happens to be the name of the film director who directed Mad Max, among other things. Um, and, you know, this is a name that I think at this meeting, for example, when people talk about George Miller, I mean, I'm the only one that's talked about Mad Max, probably. Everybody else is talking about... <laughs> Um, you know, this guy, the father of WordNet. Um, but when you do, you know, you do a Google search or some other, you know, Yahoo search or whatever you like, there's a real mixing here. And if you look at what we're seeing in these in these snippets, one could argue that these are, you know, kind of short contexts, and it would be awfully nice to be able to cluster them, organize them such that you get kind of cleaner, um, uh, cleaner result. Um, and, and um, just if you, if you follow one of these links about George Miller, I think the, the magical number seven link, I think, um, you end up with, uh, you know, you get into some larger amounts of text here that you can, uh, you know, you could treat as a headless context or as a, in this case, it does, we do have um, the name in the text as well. But, you know, you can kind of imagine that, you know, if you, if you search down, you know, one step from the page you find with the, with the headed context, that maybe you find some headless contexts, and maybe you want to organize those as well. Um, and the reason um, the reason we care uh, about the language independent aspect of it is that this is a common issue in most languages that have information online. If you do it, if you do a web search, for example, for George Miller um, of Romanian uh, web pages, um, you find again this kind of mixing of George Miller, the, the film director, George Miller, the WordNet uh, father, and, um, yeah, I mean, it looks like George Miller, the, uh, the film director, is a little more popular um, here, but, uh, but nonetheless, that's the kind of problem that we're thinking about here. Not necessarily web search, but this is just one that we've probably all had experience of, and maybe we can map our own problems to something like this. Um, and. Uh, Romanian headless contexts, uh, and, so. and, and and the nice thing is that with what we're doing, um, the way that we're going to do things, we can we can deal with that, and we don't you know we don't have to worry about finding a Romanian parser, uh, Romanian named entity extractor, or anything like that. So you know, that's kind of nice. Um, it should be pointed out, and it, you, you may have thought you know there are web services that do try and provide this kind of clustering. I just I just would mention one of them that um, you know at times does a reasonably good job. 
Um, there's, uh, if you go to clusty.com and do these kinds of searches, they'll try and provide this kind of organization for you. And, um, you know, at times it's pretty useful. Um, and so, um, you know, this might give some insight into uh, some of the different things that they may be thinking about. Um, so, so that's one kind of application. Just to illustrate the headless application a little bit more, um, email, for example, uh, I think we can think of as, as typically being headless contexts. They're usually relatively short, um, and usually there's not going to be a single word that kind of unifies all your email messages. Uh, but certainly we can cluster email messages together um, and, you know, just try and impose some organization upon, um, you know, for example, the, the mail that we have sent or that we have um, received. And this is just a snapshot of my, of my uh, mailbox, which I realize is probably, I don't know, I'm sure some of the people who sent me an email probably worry a little bit about this, but I don't think there's anything like personal there my disease, you know, you know, from someone in the last six months of my life or something like that. I don't think there's anything like that. But, but the idea is this is this is not organized in any useful way. My sent mail box is just a disaster. It's just one big you know, thing. And, um, you know, imagine being able to organize that at least some way so that you have different groups of messages, at least maybe work and personal mail or something to that effect. Uh, these are the kinds of things we want to think about. Um, there are efforts to organize some of these kinds of information sources. If you, if you think of news groups as a kind of email, sort of a public email. Um, indeed, Google Groups, you know, formerly Usenet, uh, does provide kind of a hierarchy. But the problem there, of course, is that you can have messages that cross boundaries and are about multiple different things. And it might be that you, know, you, you would find content you're interested in across a number of these. And so this particular hierarchy may not reflect what you're really kind of interested in. So uh, certainly that there may be a place for viewing these as headless, headless contexts and sort of clustering them uh, in some way. Um, and the same kind of thing for news articles, which we, you know, again, short contexts. Uh, and we see that, we see a good example of that in things like Google News and so forth. They're to some degree already doing that. And, um, you know, we can perhaps kind of reflect upon how they do that a little bit as we look at things. Um, blogs, you know, all kinds of, there's all, you know, anywhere you find these short units of text, there may be some desire to organize them. And um, so, so that leads kind of into the, 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 the sticky issue of when we say similar, what do we really mean? You know, what, what does it mean to be similar? And that, you know, could turn into a long, long sort of discussion. Um, and uh, there, there's been a lot of thinking and writing about that um, from the point of view of, uh, you know, cognitive science and linguistics and language and so forth. Um, and we're taking a view here, kind of a very distributional view, uh, that the, the, the similar contexts, um, or that the, the, the meaning, if you will, or the intended sense of a word is, is largely going to be uh, dictated by the, uh, how similar the contexts are. Or that is, similar words that occur in similar contexts likely have similar sorts of meanings. Um, and we, when we talk about name discrimination, for example, uh, we were kind of extending that a little bit, just saying that, well, names that occur in similar contexts are potentially about the same person. So George Miller, if you can identify two or three different sets of similar context, it may be that there are two or three different George Millers uh, at play there. Um, so, so that's kind of a um, sort of overview and kind of motivational comments perhaps. Any, any questions about any of that? Any, any worries about what you've gotten into here? Um, Pardon? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, is that, will we get in trouble if we open the windows? I'm willing to take that, I'm willing to take that risk. Um, yeah. Any, any other? So, 
so, um, so, so, so there's a basic sort of methodology that we'll, we'll overview here and then start to go into some of the details of it um, as, as we proceed onward. Um, we have some collection of contexts that we would like to cluster into these similar groups. Um, and we, we have various choices about how we go about representing those contexts. Um, and we'll talk about both how we identify features that can be used to identify those contexts and then how we represent those features so that we can represent the context. And there are a variety of choices there. Um, once we have done that, we will end up typically with some kind of a vector or matrix representation. And we may wish to consider reducing the dimensionality of that for a variety of reasons. And, and so we'll talk about a particular uh, technique a little bit, uh, singular value decomposition that can be used for that. Um, and then, you know, then we want to actually do the clustering. And there's, there's, there's a number of choices there to be made in terms of clustering algorithms and criterion functions and things like that. And, you know, clearly we're kind of, we're kind of covering a fairly large uh, spectrum of material here. So, so I think perhaps what I'm, I'm, I'm trying to do in the discussion here is to uh, present some, you know, I think what are reasonable methods and some kind of highlights, uh, and, and, but certainly not suggesting that, that this is sort of the optimal set of you know, things that one should do for this. That, that will depend on a lot of, um, a lot of different factors, uh, but certainly this is a pretty good starting point, um, and it might, in fact, do pretty much what you want to do. Um, so when we're finding the number of, you know, when we're clustering uh, the, the, the contexts um, or the vectors that are now representing the contexts, um, there's the issue of how do we know or find out how many clusters uh, we have. Um, you know, can we have any hope of actually automatically identifying the clusters and things like that? Um, and then there's the issue of, of uh, evaluating or using the contexts. Um, so we'll, we'll try and touch upon all of these as we go along. And so that brings us to a, um, uh, a starting point, I guess, in terms of um, what kinds of features are we going to use as we try and represent these contexts. And since we want to be language independent, we're, we're putting, you know, that, that very hard constraint is, is, is on us and will follow us through this process. And so in order to honor that constraint, primarily what we're going to be looking at is identifying uh, lexical features from either the context that we're going to cluster or perhaps from some other corpus source um, and using, um, you know, a variety of techniques that will let us assess um, how, how reasonable or useful these features will be. Um, and so that's, that's kind of the nature of, uh, of, the, of the feature identification process. So, so when we say features, um, um, and by the way, I, I am trying to um, make this a fairly self-contained presentation, by the way. I'm not presuming any great familiarity with any of these issues. Um, and so if you're familiar with them, just kind of bear with me a little. Um, and if, if you feel that um, if I have jumped over something important, um, I've done so without meaning to. And so, so surely you can, you, you can feel comfortable asking because the intent is that, that, that this be relatively self-contained. Um, so when we're talking about features here, what, what, we, what we're talking about are um, whatever it is that is going to represent sort of the the discriminating or distinguishing or salient characteristics of the context that we would like to cluster. And, um, you know, we want to find the, the information that's going to let us make these distinctions. Um, and in the end, what we want to do is to represent each context that we want to cluster as some kind of a vector where the dimensions are based on whatever features it is we've decided to use. Um, and so the vectors of the context that have some of the same features are going to be the ones that get clustered together. And so the features, as, uh, you know, as you might guess, are fairly crucial for this whole, this whole enterprise. So in, 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 in this kind of clustering and unsupervised environment, um, features can come from, as I mentioned, either the data that we're going to cluster or from some other data. And sometimes people get kind of squeamish when you talk about, well, you're finding the features from the data that you're clustering. I mean, Cheater, you know. That's the, I mean, so that's why I said this is not cheating. In fact, because the data that you're clustering doesn't really have any kind of labeled class information that makes it, you know, like in supervised learning, this would be, 
you know, peaking in a very major way. Um, but we don't have anything like that here. And in fact, it may be sort of a practical necessity. I mean, if you're, if you're clustering web search results, you may simply need to use those web search results as the basis of the information that you're using to make the distinctions. You don't have to, but you may, you know, well, you might have to. Um, uh, or, or you may be in a situation where you have another data that you can use. Um, so um, so we'll, we'll think in terms of having the context that we're going to cluster, which we, we'll refer to that as test or evaluation data. Um, and then if we have a separate held out set of data that we use for feature um, identification as well, well, we'll refer to that as training data, which is a little bit of a misnomer, but that's terminology that is sometimes used in, uh, in this, this particular framework. Um, and uh, so we'll just kind of need to accept that little ambiguity. Because in supervised learning, of course, training data means that you've got labeled examples. And that's not what we mean. Um, and so, um, the, um, so this is kind of what I was, um, what I was just referring to. Um, the training data, if we have it, is just used to identify features. We won't cluster that. We're always going to be clustering this evaluation data. Um, and this, this term, or this use of, the, of, the, of training in this sense is, is due to uh, Schutz, um, who um, uh, described some of these methods um, in, an, in an earlier paper. And so we're just kind of adopting that terminology, but you know, please don't misunderstand that to mean that we have labeled data. We, we have nothing of the sort. Um, so any, any questions about that? This is the first, this is the first, you know, this is the first thing that sometimes trips people up. Because when you when we use that term training data, they think, oh my gosh, you're labeling data now. I mean, what happened? You, know, you were going to be unsupervised. It sounded so great, and now I'm going to have to annotate data. I mean, you, you won't. I mean, it's, it's not that bad. So, um, so we're going to identify features either from the data we're going to cluster or from some other set of data. Um, these features are going to be, or can, I mean, they can be a lot of different things um, and still be readily identified or extracted from the, uh, the corpora that we have. Um, but we're going to focus on a few different relatively simple kinds of features, um, including unigrams, bigrams, co-occurrences, and, and what we call target co-occurrences. Um, and some of these I'm sure are familiar, perhaps all of them. Um, unigrams just simply being um, a single word that happens to occur more than some number of times. Um, and bigrams being an ordered pair of words that uh, occur either beyond some frequency cutoff or that may occur um, more significantly uh, or more, more often than we'd expect by chance. And that's where we start to get into some measure, measures of association and things like that, which we'll talk about. Um, we do allow bigrams to either be consecutive or to have intervening words between them, perhaps two or three uh, words between them. Uh, to allow for a, a little bit of variation in their form. Um, and uh, they are ordered, though. Bigrams are ordered. It matters which word is first and which is second in the pair. And co-occurrences are much like bigrams, except we don't have that order. It doesn't, they, they can occur in either order. Um, and this, this turns out, I mean, these, these seem perhaps like very small differences, but you, you'll see, I think, that the difference when you do some things with bigrams or co-occurrences, the differences turn out at times to be very, uh, very huge. Um, and then we have as well the notion of a target co-occurrence, which is uh, just a target co-occurrence where one of the words happens to be the target word. So, so the idea there is in the headed context that you have um, uh, words that are occurring within some number of positions of the target word as features, whereas bigrams or co-occurrences can occur anywhere within the context as well with unigrams. So these are, the, these are the different sorts of features that we'll be looking at. And these are all included in the, in the software that you'll have available. Um, and so, um, so, so unigrams probably are fairly straightforward. Um, bigrams, just to give a few examples, um, we, may, we can set um, what's called a window size that will indicate um, if we're going to have any intervening words or not. If we set the window size to 2, it means that the bigrams must be uh, the words that make the bigram must be adjacent. They must not be interrupted by any other words. Um, if we set the window size greater than two, then we're allowing for the possibility of intervening words. And um, so if we set the window size to four, for example, uh, what that means is that we can have zero, one, or two intervening words between the words that form the bigram. And, and 
you know, these again, it may seem like kind of small potatoes here, but these kinds of, these are the kinds of things that as you vary them, as you, as you experiment with them, they, they have a very profound impact actually on what happens. Um, and um, typically with biograms, um, and there's, there's not a law or a kind of a, you know, a, an error message that's going to come out um, if, you, if you do something otherwise, but typically with biograms, we, we normally think in terms of fairly small window sizes, um, you know, maybe, you know, kind of two to four words, um, and, and we're perhaps looking for something that, that's more like a collocation, that is kind of a regular pattern, this ordering matters. Um, if, you, if you start to stretch beyond that, it seems to us perhaps that you're getting into the realm of co-occurrence co behavior. It's not so much that they occur in a particular order, but rather that they're just occurring together. You know, if you have a window size of 10, it's, there's a lot of intervening words there that you're skipping over. And so if you, if you find larger window sizes appealing, it might be that that's where you draw the line between biograms and co-occurrences. That's you know, just if you're wondering, when would you use one or the other? It sort of depends on your philosophy things and, um, and and so uh, so so you can notice in the examples that I'm showing here the biograms are you know things like fine wine or baseball bat that we typically say in that order with some regularity and the co-occurrences are, are in the best case at least um, maybe pairs of words that occur together not in any particular order that's sort of the big difference there um, our reason for relying on or using bigrams and co-occurrences so much is that when, you, when you're dealing with unigrams, you're, you're not really getting much help in terms of being able to eliminate noise, ambiguity, anything like that. But, but, but when words start traveling in pairs, they, they oftentimes tend to be a lot less ambiguous. I mean, when you look at, you know, trying, you know, two word sequences or three word sequences or what have you, um, just oftentimes don't seem to have as much ambiguity associated with them. And if your goal is to do some kind of clustering or discrimination, that seems very useful. Um, that said, um, the unigrams oftentimes perform quite nicely. Uh, and so, so they certainly shouldn't be ignored. But that's kind of the motivation for, uh, for, for using or including biograms and co-occurrences. Um, and, um, uh, you know, the other thing is that if you, if you if you're dealing with unigram features, you can end up with just a huge number of features that you're only able to cut off by frequency, uh, you know, beyond a certain frequency threshold, and that can reduce it quite a lot. But the number of features that you have tends to be quite a lot less when you're dealing with bigrams and co-occurrences because you can use some of the measures of association that we'll talk about that will hold down their number, and that can become important. So any questions about, about any of that? Uh, to, to this point. Okay. So, um, so whenever we start to say things like occurring together more often than expected by chance, this is this this can always turn into kind of dangerous stuff, maybe. But um, that's not so bad, really. Um, we do, in the case of bigrams and co-occurrences, allow for and support the use of a variety of measures of association, and you have quite a lot of choices with, with respect to that. Um, it is important with all these choices that you have some idea of what you're choosing. Um, and uh, there is some subtlety to it. Um, we, we are able to, to do um, uh, these kinds of measures of association. Um, and when we talk about things that occur together more often than expected by chance, uh, typically what we look at are the observed frequencies for the pair of, so there's a pair of words that are forming a, a bigram, and we're wondering whether or not that's interesting. Is this something that's more often occurring more often than we'd expect by chance? Um, we can we can basically construct a small two by two table that shows us how often the pair of words occur, how often they occur individually, and then uh, carry out um, sort of the statistical machinery um, based on those observed frequencies. We can calculate expected values, um, and these expected values tell us how often the word two individual words and a pair of words should occur if they're independent. That is, they have no, you know, they, do, they are occurring together by chance. And we essentially compare what we observe with what's expected under those circumstances and see to what degree they deviate. Uh, and if they deviate a lot, 
then it might be that they're occurring more often than we'd expect by chance. That's kind of the basic mechanism. Um, we do with, with bigrams, we do, one of the nice things about bigrams is we have a very powerful sort of feature um, uh, control there in that we can throw out bigrams that, in, that, are, that include either one or two stop words. And, you know, so that means, you know, like, of the, you, you, you know, you don't want that as a feature. Um, you know, uh, you know, the president, maybe you do, maybe you don't, but you, you have that ability. And so if you, if you eliminate bigrams that include even one stop word, you, 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 in that one fell swoop, you significantly reduce the number of features that you're dealing with. That, that you know, that can be a good thing. That can be a bad thing. And so it's, it's important to, uh, to look at and consider all of those points. So here's, here's just a, a, a simple example to sort of illustrate um, this, uh, the, this, this particular kind of method that's used in some of the measures of association that you will have at the ready. Let's suppose we're considering the, um, uh, the bigram artificial intelligence and trying to decide if that is occurring more often than we'd expect by chance. And this representation is telling us that artificial intelligence occurred, those two words occurred together a hundred times, and that intelligence occurred 300 times, and artificial occurred 400 times. And then the total number of bigrams in our data is 100,000. That's what we. That's the observed data. That's these are the counts. Now these are ones I made up just to keep the math kind of simple. Um, but that's what we've observed. Now, based on that, we can through the magic of algebra fill in the rest of the values, and so we get a complete two by two table that shows us all the counts. And so, for example, this means that artificial occurs in a bigram with a word other than intelligence three hundred and that there are 99,400 biograms that neither include artificial nor intelligence, that kind of information. So these are, this is the complete set of observed counts, the observed frequencies. And we can calculate then the expected values based on the hypothesis of independence. Um, and there's, there's a little bit of statistical machinery here at work, but the basic, the basic way that this calculation is done is that you take um, You take what th these values we refer to as marginal totals. There's a laser pointer? Yes. Oh, that's so much better. Okay. So, um, so these values we refer to as marginal totals. We may call them row, or row marginals and column marginals. Um, but essentially, one takes the product to find out the expected value for this cell. We take the product of the row and column marginal associated with that and divide that by the total number of bigrams. And we get this kind of very miniaturized value. Um, and we do the same thing for the other cells. So we, what we're saying here is that based on these marginal totals, it will look to us like uh, if, if, if artificial and intelligence really are occurring together by accident, we expect the counts to look something like the purple numbers. Um, and so the question is, well, how do you decide? I mean, you can look at that and you can say, well, you know, they're sort of close. Um, and, but, but we can do better, right? You know, we can, we can, we can actually do that in a real way. Um, you'll notice and perhaps you'll be alarmed by this very small expected value. This, this is actually kind of characteristic of when you take these kind of approaches on these kinds of accounts. Um, statisticians, if any of you are trained statisticians, you you, you would have perhaps left by now, having seen this table, um, because we're, you know, this kind of a this kind of skewness in the marginal totals um, is is not necessarily what these tests were designed to accommodate. Now they work well enough for our purposes. What what we what we end up violating here are certain sort of statistical theorems that, you know, may, uh, you know, we we may in fact have a different sort of asymptotic distribution than what would classically be predicted here or something like that. But in terms of actually predicting or deciding what features, it doesn't seem like this is such a bad thing. And this is not, you know, if you're if you have children and stuff, this is not what you want to hear. It's you know, it's like everybody does this. You know, so I mean don't don't worry about it. It's not a good reason necessarily, but it seems to it seems to it seems to work 
Um, there are ways to get by these. There are other kinds of techniques, um, for example, things like exact tests, but that kind of takes us, that's an example of where this is a good starting point. There are other things you can do. If you find this unnerving, then you, know, you, can, you can certainly pursue that. Um, but the concern here is that, I mean, this is, this, this is point one two. So this means any value greater than zero is gonna be more than that, more than what we'd expect if these occur together by chance. And so you may think, well, everything is going to look like it occurs together more often than expected. Um, that's not necessarily true, but, um, uh, but this kind of uh, number is quite, this kind of uh, disparity between the observed and expected values is fairly typical. Um, any questions about, yeah, it's a little bit of a digression in the statistics thing. Um, so, we have, we have a number of different techniques that can be used. Once, once we have calculated these observed and expected values, we can do various kinds of measures of association that will let us essentially say how much the observed values deviate from what we expect, and then we can make a decision about whether or not this biogram is interesting for us. And two of the more common, and these are measures that are, are supported in the software you'll see, um, are the log likelihood ratio, or G squared, and uh, Pearson's test, or Pearson's chi-squared test is sometimes called. And we can see here we're basically comparing the observed and the expected values, in this case a difference and a sum, here a ratio and a sum. Um, if you do the calculations, you get numbers that look like this. And these numbers can in themselves be kind of useful. And in fact, oftentimes, this is all we need. We need these numbers to be able to rank our bigrams, and then we can you know, reach a decision about a certain cutoff point beyond which the values um, or those biograms beyond that point will be um, the ones we use as features. Now these, these numbers are, are actually very huge for these kinds of measures of association as we'll see. Uh, but again, if you're, if you're concerned mostly with relative ranking, that's not such a big, uh, a big concern. Um, so, so, so what do these scores tell us? Um, well, just to, just to pay tribute to, to our sort of statistical brethren, um, these, the log likelihood ratio and Pearson's test are both, it's, it's been shown and proven um, that these tests are generally asymptotically approximated by the chi-square distribution. It's, it's very kind of powerful language you can throw at people. Um, and so what this means in a practical sense is that if you, if you were to fix these marginal totals at their observed values, and then start generating lots and lots of random tables that obey the constraints of the marginal totals. And if you calculate that log likelihood scores and Pearson scores over hundreds of thousands of such trials, or maybe even a few hundred, and if you, if you plot the distribution of those scores, you will get something that looks like our friend the chi-square chi -square distribution. And, and the amazing thing is that it, it turns out, this turns out to be true, and I've, I've you know, I've, oftentimes people have objected, you know, very strenuously to these, oh my gosh, these evaluate, these, these violate the asymptotic assumptions of the measure. You know, and you feel bad about that, and so I finally decided, well, I'm going to check. And so I use these marginal totals, and I start generating, I start generating tables, and they come out looking like the chi-square distribution. So, you know, so I feel a little better about that. Um, you can, if you wish, interpret these kinds of measures in terms of statistical significance. Now this is not something that the software you'll see will, will do, um, but you can, in, you can in effect do it by learning certain of these key values. I mean, for example, one of my favorite, one of my favorite numbers here is 3.84. I know that number, and I use it very often as a cutoff score when I'm using the log likelihood ratio or Pearson's test, because what, what this means is that um, we're, we're effectively doing a hypothesis test now where the hypothesis is that the biograms are independent. And so this value, if your score is greater than 3.84, there's a 95% chance that the null hypothesis is um, true, or is false, sorry. Um, there's a 95% chance that the, that the null hypothesis is not true. That is, they are not independent. And so if you compare 3.84 to what we have, you, know, you can see these are quite a lot larger. Um, and, um, and so you can use these kinds of numbers as cutoffs. Um, we are just dealing with one degree of freedom in these kinds of tests because 
Um, you, can, you can understand that by looking at this. Um, once we have one of the interior cells filled in and we have the, you know, we have the associated marginal totals, all the other values come to us from algebra. And so that, this is kind of that one degree of freedom. And so when you look at these, look at these tables, um, you just look at the first line and then you can, you know, you can pick your poison. Um, so, so the, um, so values above a certain level of significance that you can pick arbitrarily or you can appeal to these distributional tables um, uh, can provide you uh, grounds for rejecting the null hypothesis. And the null hypothesis is always that the bigrams or the words that make up the bigram are independent. That is always the null hypothesis. Um, and so um, if we have values beyond, for example, 3.841, uh, that means that the null hypothesis can be rejected with, you know, 95% confidence. Um, there is sometimes the objection that um, not being independent is not the same as being dependent, and that is true. Uh, that is true. Uh, and so, um, it, but, it, but this is a case where we make kind of a reasonable inference or assumption that, well, if they're not, if they're not independent, perhaps they have some kind of relationship. Um, and, and oftentimes it turns out to be true, and it, it's just, you know, it's important if you're with your statistical brethren not to say that you did a test that showed that the words in the Bible were dependent. Then they would mock you, but you say they're not independent. There, you, have any of you met people like that? I may have just been scarred, but I mean, they just, you know, when you start using these kinds of things, I mean, they're being protective of what they do, and, you know, we all probably understand that, because when people delve into whatever our area is, we sort of sometimes, you know, try and push them around a little bit. Um, and so they do the same thing. They mean well, you know. So, so you just have to be careful. Um, so I forgot about the video camera. <laughs> so none of, none of that was. That's what happened. I'm not afraid. Um, so um, we have a number of different measures of association that, uh, and tests of significance included in the sense clusters package that can be used. And, and all of these come to us from another package that we've worked on called the Ngram Statistics Package. So if, if you happen to be familiar with that, that's kind of built into sense clusters now along with a bunch of other stuff. And that's where we get these measures from. And there's you know, quite a number of options here. Different kinds of, the, these are the different measures that we have. Primarily for bigrams, um, and um, you can see that they run the gamut from these more sort of formal tests of association to uh, to other measures that are more um, you know just measures of association. Some of which may not be that appropriate for bigrams, but we in we include them nonetheless, uh, just for co-occurrences, just in case um, uh, you know they might be useful. Um, and and this is the kind of thing that as you experiment with. You, know, you see again quite a lot of difference in um, the results that we get. So, so these, so this is the lexical features that we are. Um, these are the lexical features that we're going to be interested in, and in, in, in an idea of how we're going to go about getting them. Uh, we do have the option of just using simple frequency count cutoffs, and that can oftentimes work very well. Just take all the biograms that occur more than five times, or all the, you know, with unigrams, you kind of only have the frequency cutoffs. Um, so, you know, all the unigrams that occurred 20 times or more and are not stop words, things like that. This is how we get our features. Um, this, uh, you know, this is uh, something that we can apply to a, a lot of different languages without any significant work. Um, and, and that's one of the reasons why we like them. Um, and even if one, you know, even if one has, you know, you're working with the same language all the time, you have certain resources available, it, it seems reasonable to me to start with something you know, relatively simple, see where that gets you, and then add to that, and not start with the big, full-blown approach, uh, because then you can't really see where you're getting the gains in, in your performance from. Um, and if everything is, in fact, being handled by unigrams, and you've added all this other stuff to it, um, you know, it can, it can make it kind of, uh, you have a lot of unnecessary stuff happening. And so, um, so that's kind of how we're gonna go about getting our features. Um, if you are interested in some of these statistical issues, um, 
about the bigram tests, um, there are a couple of different papers that are worth looking at. The most recent of was at EMNLP 2004, and this is actually nice because it kind of it kind of synthesizes some of this stuff, and um, you know, does it in a way that I think is quite understandable and has kind of a, a, a practical focus to it. And uh, and so this might be a, this might be a good starting point if you're interested in more reading about these kinds of measures um, as you go along. So. Any questions about any of that uh, material? So we will, uh, you know, this is this is one of the places where you have there's a lot of different variations that you can see. Yes, yes. Uh, with the log likelihood ratio on the previous slide, you had in brackets two. Mm. I'm not sure what uh, you mean by this. Oh, oh, the Roman numeral two actually. Right. These are, yeah, that's a good point. These are um, the names of the modules that do that work in the Ngram statistics package. And these are, the, these are actually, this is actually what you'll see when you're using sense clusters, um, how you choose. So you don't actually, well, actually, I think we do have it expanded out. But um, uh, if you create your own command line version of things, then you have to specify this, um, the measure that you want by the abbreviation, if you will. So it's actually LL. Oh, um, sorry. Yeah. Mm, so, thank yeah. you. No, that's a that's a good mm. that's a good point. Any, any other? So, so, so we've seen how we're going to identify our features. I mean, that's that's what we're going to do. I mean, so we're, we're going to have some evaluation data that we want to cluster. We're going to do these kind of methods uh, to get lexical features out of there, unigrams, bigrams, co-occurrences, and target co-occurrences. Um, or we're going to get that from some other set of data. Um, but we're going to apply the same kinds of methods. And then we have these contexts that we want to represent in such a way that we can cluster them. And so that brings us to sort of the next uh, topic, uh, that being uh, context representation. So, so so, and, and, and here the issue is, how do we represent the context that we want to cluster, the things that we want to discriminate? Um, and, and, and we talk about um, two different kinds of representation, first and second order, um, and we'll, we'll clarify that as we go along. So we have a set of features that we have selected using what, we've, what we believe to be the best kind of feature, the best measure for identifying them, the best cutoffs, in terms of frequency, in terms of uh, scores, measures of association. We can also cut off based on rank, take the top 100 according to the T-score. All these different things can be done. Um, and um, you know that's based on our kind of experience and intuition. Um, and so we, we have that now. We have that set of features. And then the question is, how do we use that to convert the context that we want to cluster into a form that will cluster. And so, um, so that's what we'll, we'll describe here a little bit. Um, a first order representation is, is probably something you're familiar with um, if, you've, if you've done any, you know, any type of machine learning or any, any sort of work like that. Um, and, and, and so we're giving it a name that might, you, you might not often, you might not use this name, you might just talk about feature vectors and things like that, but we, we introduced this first and second order uh, distinction um, because they both end up being feature vectors. They're just different, different kinds of feature vectors. So we have to add a little clarifying uh, language here. And um, so, so in this case, each of the contexts is represented by a vector with some number of dimensions. And each dimension indicates or, or stands for a certain feature. And then essentially, we have a value in that vector that tells us whether or not that feature occurred in that context. So, so I've, I've probably made something that's fairly intuitive, fairly, fairly uh, complex with that. Um, these can be binary values, they could be frequency counts, they could be some other kind of score. Um, but, but you can imagine a matrix where you have contexts on the row, the context that you want to cluster on the row, and the features that you're using to base that decision on the columns. And so here's some contexts um, that uh, 
I, I have no good explanation as to why I took a voodoo theme with them. Um, so anyway, so the contexts are, um, you know, for example, there was there was an island curse of black magic cast by that voodoo child. We want to represent that in such a way that we can cluster it relative to the other context. Um, and as you might guess, these are made up. I mean, I don't know if these exist anywhere, probably not. Except here now, they exist. Um, and so let's suppose that through some mechanism, not based on that, that just those four contexts, but let's suppose we had uh, some corpus that we got frequency counts from. And we created a set of unigram features that include island, black, curse, magic, child. Um, these are our features now. And so we'll, it, to create a first order representation, um, all we're doing, we, we just take those features, run them along columns, and then indicate which of, indicate here in the, in, through the use of binary values, which of those features occurred and which of the contexts. So this, you know, this is your typical kind of feature vector, bag of words kind of feature vector. So if you're familiar with that, that's that's what this that's pretty much what this is, um, and then you can you know you can cluster these vectors, now. and that's it is it is possible for what you do to be as simple as that, select unigrams based on frequency cutoff, cluster them, boom you're done, and that's that's a, a reasonable that's a reasonable way to proceed. Um, we could also get um, in, we could we could look for bigrams, um, for example. Um, you know, island curse, black magic, voodoo child, we have some kind of score here, and these all presumably occurred, and these all have scores higher than some cutoff we specified. Um, and we could, we could have a first order representation of bigram features where essentially for each context, we indicate does this bigram occur in this or not. Um, I'm, I'm sort of laboring a little bit to describe this just because we use bigrams again in the second order case, and I want to make sure that they don't get sort of conflated uh, or confounded uh, in, in, as, as, you, as you think about them. So, so we're just indicating context one. If we look back at it, you know, we, we see island curse, black magic, voodoo child, um, and that's what the first vector tells us. So very, very, uh, very straightforward. Um, so, um, so these are these are examples of first order vectors. Um, you, you have a choice to use first or second order vectors. Uh, these can have you know the binary values or some kind of frequency or something like that. Um, and we end up with a, a context by feature matrix that we then can cluster. We have the option of reducing or smoothing that matrix using singular value decomposition, which we will talk about after we've talked about the second order features. Uh, but whether you do SVD or not, the contexts are ready for clustering at this point. And so that's one way to represent the context. And it's, it's a very reliable, standard sort of way to do these things. And it's, it's certainly a good starting point. And it may perform perfectly adequately, depending on what kind of data you have. Any questions about, about that? OK. So the second order features require a little bit more explaining. Um, I'll, I'll preface this by saying that if you're familiar with uh, latent semantic analysis, latent semantic indexing, uh, or Schutz's work, if you know Schutz's work very well with context vectors and things like that, that's pretty much what we're doing here. If you don't know what those things are, that's fine. But just, you know, just in the event you do, you can kind of anticipate what, what's coming, perhaps. Um, the first order features directly encode the occurrence of a feature in a context. It's, you know, the first order kind of implies a direct, uh, direct indication of what features occur in the context. Um, the second order features aren't encoding exactly what occurs in the context. That, that's kind of, a, that's kind of a, a, a curious thing to think about at first. Um, but um, the, the features, the contexts, um, we, we have these contexts, and for some of the words in the context, at least, we will acquire a vector, a co-occurrence vector, essentially a first-order vector for each of the words in the context, or each of the content words in the context, um, that we will then use to create a representation of the context. And we'll talk about that in a little more, a little more detail here. Um, so in the second-order representation, 
we, we first create um, a, a word by word matrix from our feature set. And, and here we have to be using biograms or co-occurrences to as our features because because we need to have you know words on the rows, words on the columns of our matrix. And if we're using biograms, then the first word in the biogram is you know is, is, is one of the rows, and the second word is, is one of the columns. If we're using co-occurrences, then it's a more symmetric kind of relationship. Um, so um, so in this word-by-word -word matrix based on the features, essentially we have um, all of the first words on the rows, all the second words on the columns, and in the cells we have perhaps their association score, we might have a frequency count, we might have a binary value, anything like that, but we again end up with a matrix. Now this is a word-by-word -word matrix or a feature-by-feature -feature matrix, if you will, whereas when we were talking about the first order representation, we had a context-by-feature representation. So here another matrix, but this is now feature by feature. Um, and we can again optionally perform SVD on that if we wish for reasons that we'll talk about um, momentarily. Um, but once we have finished and we have that feature by feature matrix, then we look at the context that we want to cluster and we replace each word in, in these contexts for which we have a row vector with that vector. And so you can imagine the, um, the context is, is you know, this kind of series of words, and the words are essentially being replaced by these vectors that go shooting off into space. And so you, you, know, you get this kind of thing happening. And you, you average together all of these vectors to create that representation of the context. So you, so you, have, you have taken information about the words in the context, not you know, or, you know, the features in, in that context, and, and added that to this representation. Um, and that's why we say it's a little, it's, it's not just a direct indication of what features occur in the context, but rather it adds a little extra. Um, and uh, this, this methodology is, is, is very much what, um, very much like what um, Schutz describes um, in, in his word sense discrimination work. It's, it's very much related to what happens in LSI and LSA, so that's if you're familiar with that, um, you, you may see some of that uh, commonality. Um, so just an example to kind of keep it, you know, keep it uh, sensible here. And this is based on one of the earlier slides. Um, we simply re-represent that set of features uh, in a matrix form now where we see the biogram black magic and it has its association score of 123.5, island curse 189.2, etc., etc. That's that's the matrix we create. Um, our word by word or feature by feature matrix. Um, we, we can, in fact, um, and this is something that um, you'll see uh, in, in, the, in the software, is that we can actually stop things at this point uh, with this word by word or feature by feature matrix and actually cluster this and get sets of related words that way. And that's something that we include. We, it's kind of a, a happy side effect of some of the other things we do, and so we decided to kind of bring it out and make it visible. Um, in the uh, in the package because it seemed like it might potentially be useful. Um, it's not something, to be honest, we've experimented with a whole lot, but um, it is there and it is kind of interesting to look at. And so it, it'll become clear as we look at that where that where that entails. But when you when you see some mention of word clustering, it's based on taking this second order representation and essentially stopping it at this stage and clustering the rows uh, in this in this particular representation. So, um, so, so, the, um, so each of these rows in that matrix, that feature by feature matrix, essentially represents a first order co-occurrence vector for that word. And then we take the context we want to cluster and replace the word by its vector of first order co-occurrences. And so that's why we, we call that uh, second order representation because we're we're sort of backing away from the literal representation of the word and rather representing it uh, as the, um, representing by the words with which it co-occurs. Um, and um, we'll see a little bit of a, a, a little bit of, a, of an example here. Um, this is the context I want to cluster. And island, black, and voodoo are the three words for which I have rows in my matrix. So if we, if we go back here, this is the matrix that I'm using 
for this context representation exercise. And so uh, this is the context I want to cluster. I, I essentially take uh, island, black, and voodoo and uh, essentially throw everything else out of the context. Uh, so we're down to three, to three words here. And then we have the vectors associated with island, black, and voodoo that we then average together to get us the new representation of the context. So it's kind of a radical transformation of the context, and that may or may not be appropriate. I mean, if you find that to be a bit too much, um, you know, you may simply want to work in the first order um, case where, where things are a little more um, um, apparent. Um, but um, but this, um, the, so, so, the, so the, the, the notion that this captures, though, that we find to be interesting, and, and, and I think I should certainly make made this point, as of others, uh, that these second order co-occurrences can be very useful in terms of um, uh, grouping or relating uh, words that are similar to each other, uh, even if they don't share any kind of patterns or, or you know, context uh, between them. And so, um, so for example, um, we can we can say. Um, let's see. So we can see here if we look at this vector. If we look at the vectors for black and island. We can see actually that we're going to we're going to assess some similarity there between Black and Island because of the fact that both of them uh, are, are are some have some occurrence with child that that brings them together um, in, in a way that we wouldn't necessarily see if we didn't uh, use the second order representation and um, and the same uh, so we would say here that Black and Island are second order co-occurrences with each other um, since they occur with child each of them occurs with child but they aren't directly observed with each other. That is, black island doesn't occur, but black child and um, island child do. And so that brings black and island together. Um, and it's it, that, if we're talking about assessing similarity, this kind of bringing together of things that are somewhat indirectly related might potentially be useful. Um, and you can think about, sometimes I think about these contexts as, as, as actually being sort of rewritten where the you get this, um, co-occurrence information put into the context. And that's, that's what I'm kind of trying to show here, so that um, uh, you can see that, um, that uh, there was an island curse of black magic. Yes, black magic. OK. Um, so, so we've replaced island with curse and child, of course. So, so um, so, so that's kind of the nature of the second order representation. And it, it, it sometimes requires a little bit, I mean, it requires a little bit more to kind of, kind of get comfortable with that. But particularly when you have relatively small amounts of data, this can be very handy because you're able to, to capture more information with less. Um, if you have a whole bunch of data, and, and whatever a whole bunch of data is will depend a lot on what you're trying to do and uh, the, the, the type of data that but if you have a lot of data, sometimes the first order methods work just perfectly well. Um, but, um, but our experience in a few different things has been that with smaller amounts of data, sometimes the second order methods can have some advantages. So that's why they're a part of this discussion. Um, and so, um, so here then is the, the representation finally of this context. We've, we've gone from the words to this vector. And if you compare that with the first order representation, you can see it's quite a lot different. It's capturing a whole lot of different stuff. Um, and so you do sometimes see rather dramatically different results. So, um, so the second order representations, like the first order representation, end up, you end up with a context by feature representation. That is, you have context on the rows, features on the columns. But the cell values are not telling you that that particular feature occurred in that context. Um, they, they are essentially indicating something about the, um, the degree to which that feature is associated with other words that occur uh, with a word in that context. And so it's giving us this kind of indirect, uh, indirect connection. Um, and so it's important not to be, um, not to try and map the first and second order to each other directly. They're, they're quite distinct. Um, and so the first order representations have the, have the virtue of being very intuitive. Um, it's fairly easy to see them. It's kind of our familiar feature vectors and bags of words. 
Um, if you don't have a lot of data, it, it can be very, very sparse and it's difficult to do much. Um, and um, um, the context, though, are telling us something very directly. Which of the features that we think are important occur in the context of the cluster? And that's, that's perfectly reasonable. Um, the second order representations are, are a little harder to visualize, um, but, but we're appealing maybe to one of our basic ideas. We're representing a word that occurs in the context by the words with which it occurs. You know, the company it keeps, its friends. Um, and, um, and, and this lets us represent and compare contexts that may not have any words in common. You know, if you have four contexts to cluster and they don't share any words in common, and you're trying to cluster them based on first order features, you're not going to get very far. Um, and with the second order representations, you might. Um, and uh, it also seems to be, a, you seem to have a little bit less sparsity with the second order representations uh, than you do the first. But this is one of the big choices when you're doing this. You know, it's like, well, do, is it first or second order? And uh, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of consequence to that choice. Uh, but they both have good reasons for being uh, selected sometimes. Um, any questions about that? So, yes? So you were at this point about the, um, the vet of the first context and just, no, that, yeah, yeah, the, yeah, that one, just talk through how you've got those. Where the numbers have come from. Yeah, let's see if we can, let's see if we have, um, it, so, so it, 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 it actually comes, um, uh, it comes from this matrix where we have, we have um, essentially uh, replaced each of the words for which we have row vectors, which is island, black, and voodoo, um, with a vector as you see there. And then when we, when we average these together, um, we essentially you know, sum, them, sum the values and divide by the number of, uh, of, of features that we have. And so um, when you look at this, then you can, if, if you kind of look, look quickly here, you kind of remember, okay, 123.5, um, when I divide by 3 is 41.2. And so it's, it's a very simple averaging operation. Um, and this is something that, you know, reasonable people can say, well, you know, averaging, that's a pretty sort of coarse operation. I mean, why don't you do something else? Um, and indeed, there are, there are perhaps other things that one might do to create these, these representations of context, but this is a good, this is a good starting point. I mean, it, it, it's, it's very much what happens in, in some of the related techniques like LSA and LSI. There's this averaging all the time that goes on. So, so primarily, these are just the average values associated with these features. I think the, I, mean, I was just checking in my head. I think the numbers work out. 189.2 divided by 3, 62.1. That seems about right. Um, so, so they're meant to be the averages. If there's any slippage there in the numbers, then that's just a mistake. Um, any other? So you would just average by the number of words not in this list, right? No, we'd essentially average by the by the number of words or the number of features that we found in the context. So in this case, we found three. So, so, so we, can imagine, we can imagine that this context, that there was an island curse of black magic cast by that voodoo child. I think perhaps I just like to talk like that. That's why I use this example. Um, and uh, you can imagine that we don't have um, because of our feature selection methods, we don't have vectors for there, was, we don't have for curse for some reason. That's kind of puzzling, but we don't. Uh, I mean, this is for the convenience of the example, right? In the normal case, we probably would. But um, to keep the example simple, we assume we don't have, we didn't observe curse in the data we got this from. Of is a stop word magic, we didn't observe cast, etc., etc. And so it's, it's only for the, the, the features that we um, or, the, or the words in the context that we have rows for, that, that we then do this averaging based on. Okay. So, um, and you can see maybe why we don't want stop words. So if you have a co-occurrence vector for of, I mean, it's just going to mess everything up. And so the stop lists are, are really quite important here. Um, any, any other? Yes? So I'm just, um I don't think I can interpret your presentation well. Can you just go back to forward to the slide where you have the so where I have with what now? Like I think it's two slides forward when you have the representation one more. 
Yeah, this one. So yeah. can we say this this means something like the value for the feature magic it means that on average this word is associated this is the strength of its association with other words in this um, context? I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm going to say yes, and then I'm going to think about it. But yeah, I think this is a measure of association. And um, we're essentially, um, you know, as, as we as if we go back here, um, it, it's to what degree is magic associated with all of the words in the context? And, and so um, if, if all of, I mean, so child has a very strong association with all the words in the context. And, and, and we notice that you know this becomes perhaps a dominant characteristic of the vector, and so it means that for this context, child is really important, um, more so than might and magic and, and curse even. Um, and so, so, so that to some degree is the is the motivation for the averaging. I mean, averaging is kind of crude, but if you have a lot of zeros, it drives down the value, and if you have a reasonable number of non-zero values. Um, as we do here, it suggests that for all the words that we care about in this context, child really matters. It, it, it's important. And so this becomes, uh, you know, as I say, a very dominant part of the vector that represents the context. So we're, we're kind of capturing something there. Um, but it's, it's and, and this is, it's good to think about these things because it, you know, it, it, it's a little counterintuitive, but then you can kind of usually reason through some of this and, and arrive at an explanation. There are lots of pitfalls, of course. Um, uh, you know, just you know, these 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 matrices in practice turn out to be a lot bigger, um, and, and we probably have more words that are being represented in the context. Uh, although we don't have to, we could we have ways of controlling that. In fact, that I will mention. Um, so, you know, there's, there's reason to be kind of concerned, but in general, there, there is sort of an idea here that we're trying to uh, exploit. Um, and so, you know, this is, you know, this is the kind of thing we're hoping to find, and we're not too bothered by this because the zeros are going to drive it down. Um, and uh, the, ones we, the thing that really worries us maybe, uh, well, it's, it's, the, it's the kind of spurious kind of stop words that, that scatter counts throughout all of that. You can see that that would just have a devastating effect on um, or scatter association scores, as the case may be, on the overall values. This one? This one. Black and iron is also similarity with voodoo. Why did you just pick out black and iron? Um, why did I pick out black and island? From the preceding slide, black and iron and the voodoo are equally similar to each other. From this, um, from from this from this slide, mm -hmm. yeah, I think I, I was um, picking out a few examples to provide some words to kind of put around it. So it wasn't meant to be it wasn't meant to be a complete listing of all the second order co-occurrences, but this is kind of how you can think about the second order co-occurrences. So indeed, yeah, there are others that we don't describe there. But, um, but it's just, I think it's important to kind of get some vocabulary, get some words that you can attach to this um, so that you're not just thinking of the matrices, but, but can start to try and interpret that second order uh, property to, to decide if it's valid for you or not. You know, it might not be worth it. Um. <coughs> other, other questions? Yeah. So um, we seem to be. We seem to be closing in at, um, at on, on, on four o'clock, and so I think what I what I would like to do is first of all um, I, I would like to go ahead and give you the CDs um, if you know just so we have them at the ready, um, and uh, uh, you may you know if you get you know, now or later you can go ahead and start using them. I think at the end I'm going to kind of do the kind of towards the end we'll start to do kind of a little bit of guided tour. Um, but let me go ahead and, and give you a CD, and, and then maybe I'll go ahead and collect your your surveys at the same time. And did anybody not get a survey? If, if you okay, so let me go ahead and issue the CDs. And uh, if you, I, I have I have a fair number of these. 
And so if you if you would like to have others, you can probably just two there. Ah, thank you. Yeah, I'm not really doing very well here. Let's see. Thank you. Let's see. Let's see. Yeah, this is, this is good. Oh, yeah, if you could, yeah, and I'll come around over there. Or not, no, that's a CD. Um, let's see, I promised to come around. And so the idea here is, you know, whenever you wish to um, put this Put this in your computer and boot it up. Boot from the CD, um, and you'll see a Linux distribution appearing before your eyes. Did everybody get a CD? Um, anybody not get a CD? Okay. Do I? And, and surveys, and then we can. Once I have your survey, why don't we? Why don't we commence the break, and then we'll come back at 4:30 and continue. Oh, you. Okay. You need the form. Sure. Thank you. Oops. I turned away. Um, other? If I yes, thank you. Yeah, so you're, you're, if I have your survey, then we'll just take our break. So everybody? And I'll put I'll put some extra CDs up here if you you know if you know somebody if you would like one or you want an extra for some reason feel free to, to, to take one. Thank you. 